sponsor program, so welcome our friends at Sonic. Kirby Smart will be our first head coach. He is entering his ninth season as the head coach at the University of Georgia. Has gone 46. Hello, beautiful people. Good morning and welcome to the SEC Media Kickoff Day. Day two. And let's welcome Kirby Smart, my first head football coach from the University of Georgia football team of the Bulldogs. Let's listen in. And for Kirby Smart, he always led his team to a to the bowl to the championship game and to a bowl games every year. Wow. Taylor Swift, which she's a big fan of. 
it's three guys we got here today. I want to speak on behalf of those guys, but I want to give you a quick story to uh, show you when you know you're getting old, and it got me yesterday. Uh, not to pick on uh, Coach Savings, I got a lot of kind words to say about him coming up, but you know, I, I always thought that, that like, oh man, Coach, I thought I saw him as older when he was coaching, and I saw myself as younger, and now I'm looking at it like, man, I'm old. I'm riding in the car yesterday with Michael, Malachi, and Carson Beck. We're coming from uh, the airport uh, to the hotel, and, and I'm sharing conversation with Michael and Malachi, and of course, what's everybody talking about yesterday? What's all college football players talking about? NCAA football game, right? The, the new game that's out, and I'm just trying to get in the conversation and talk to them about it, and I said, Man, I, 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 that game's pretty awesome. And I, yeah, I can't wait to get to the hotel, and I'm going to play it tonight, and everybody's talking about it. It's all over. It's trending. It's all over everything. And I was like, how do they keep that thing in stores? It's got to sell out. How do they keep it in stores? And Michael and Malachi just fell out laughing. And they're like, Coach, they don't, they don't sell those things in stores anymore. <laughs> they're not in the stores. And I, I was so embarrassed. But I, I was glad they got a kick out of that because it made me realize how out of touch uh, I actually am with, with how far things have come. You can just download it, go play. It's that simple. So the stores don't have to keep it. But um, the three guys we brought today, Carson Beck, Malachi Starks, Michael Williams, you know, Carson's parents, uh, Tracy and Chris, done a wonderful job with him. He is a great example of college football. The day and age when you go somewhere and you jump school to school, it's, it's, it's a popular trend. This kid stuck it out. He stuck it out now, and he didn't get the starting job in a tough moment when the starter went down, and he lost the starting job to Stetson Bennett the week of UAB game two years ago, and then said, you know what? I'm sticking with it. I'm going to persevere. I'm going to show resiliency, which is one of our core traits, and he did that. And he, he was able to monetize that value as well in form of NIL by staying and succeeding actually where his feet are. But he's a great leader for us. He's a great example of resiliency in college football. Please visit with him today um, as he's one of the leaders of our team. Malachi, uh, you know, he, he, he's such an incredible kid. You know, his, his mom, Tisha, and, and Larry, they do a great job with him. It was a joy recruiting him. He's a local kid. He started for us since day one. So all the knocks and all the things set out there about you can't start as a freshman in Georgia. It's too hard to play on defense. The first game he ever was in against Oregon, he started, and he started ever since. He's a quiet, humble leader. Um, he's a very Christian young man, and he represents our university the right way. I'm really proud to have Malachi here today. And then Michael Williams, um, you know, his mom, Shamika, and uh, John are both great people, and, and, and what a great job they've done with, with Michael. He's, he's become very versatile for us in terms of what he does on the field, but there's no greater value than what he does in that locker room because he works every day. He's physical. He enjoys practice. Uh, he's a great leader for us, and uh, he should be a huge asset for us. But please enjoy those guys um, and visit with them as they're, they're, they're huh? indicative of the locker room we have and great guys to be around. Um, oh, I don't know. I want to say to uh, all to right. Saban, who meant so much to me in my career, um, first of all, the, 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 the words he shared at the ESPYs the other night were incredible, uh, very touching, very moving. Um, but what he's meant to myself, my family, uh, as a mentor, as a, uh, a friend, as a competitor, that drives you to get better. You know, there, there's never a day in 11 years I worked for him that we didn't share a room in some sort whether that was the defensive room, defensive back room, staff room, we didn't share a room of some sort. And I think it may be who I am today because the demand for excellence is met by none other than him. So that standard that he set for me day in and day out, he met himself. And every coach that ever worked with him or for him will tell you that he does it all himself as well. He doesn't hold you uh, to any different standard than he holds himself to. So a lot of the success I've had, I give credit to him and thanks. And uh, I know he'll be critiquing me today, so I'm looking forward to that as well. Um, but he had started responding to texts. And I told people the other day, I said, that's the first time ever. Either somebody's got his phone or he's learned how to text. And that, that makes all of us in his little circle of, of friends uh, proud because we get to reach out to him. Um, we're dealing with new challenges this year. We don't have a chip on our shoulder in terms of people trying to use that as motivation. I've never used um, a failure from the previous year.
this year as motivation, and I've never used the success of a previous year's motivation. We won't do that this year. That's not who we are. Um, we want to recreate ourselves um, to say uh, in the best light we can. And this team has been fun to coach. I tend to coach. I tell people all the time, we had 15 really tough spring practices, and that includes a spring game. I probably would only trade one of those in and say, could I do it over? Did we get a lot out of those? Uh, I enjoy being on the grass with this group. They're fun to be with, uh, have a great locker room. They love each other, and they're working their butt off right now. We have four new coaches. That's a new challenge uh, for us. I don't think we've had uh, a situation where we had four new coaches. We have four new coaches coming in. I'm excited about the energy they brought, the buy-in they brought, learning our culture and uh, how we do things in our place. Some have been with us before. Some have been similar places. But I'm really excited about the four new coaches we got and being able to retain uh, Coach Muschamp was incredible because he's still an integral part of our program and he's also going to be able to watch his son play uh, for Clark at Vanderbilt. So I'm excited about that. You know, every offseason we do a study and we try to find something to look outside of football to kind of redefine ourselves and recenter and it's great for me. You know, I really think it's good to study successful people whether that's in the sports industry or whether that's in uh, the business industry. And this year we took Nike, who I've had the great pleasure of meeting uh, Phil Knight and his wonderful wife Penny, and I wish I could get some of that NIL money that he's sharing with Dan Lanning, but um, that's another note. Uh, but the study of Nike for us has been incredible. I didn't know some of the things about when Nike originated, and we took a week by week look in school sessions, breakout sessions, as well as together, and study kind of their model. And uh, one of the first things we studied was the belief of assume nothing. And I think that's so important in football. Because when you, when you assume something, or you assume you know someone, or you assume that you know somebody's name that you're in the room with, you can take things for granted. It's just like starting over from a previous year. Assume nothing. Assume nothing. Start from ground zero and build this team different than every other team. And Nike did that. Nike followed that. They assumed nothing. Where does a name come from? So if you assume that you know everybody's name, you, you may not know what that name means. We had each player get up front of the team and say what their first and middle and last name and where that came from. I encourage you, if you've never done that exercise in an organization, do it. Because you learn more about somebody when you know what they got their name from and what it stands for what it meant in their family, what it meant in their lineage. That's very important. And you get a lot of uh, deep conversations to know somebody better, which when you're on the field with somebody, you, you, you go to battle with somebody out on the field, you better be able to uh, know what their reasoning is. And I really enjoyed that, and I enjoyed our study of Nike as we went through. So with that, I want to be able to be uh, judgmental of you guys' time and answer any questions you have, so I'll open it up from there. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Seth that was a great story from Kirby Smart. As he's my favorite head coach from the University of Georgia. Bulldog uh, football so team. If we will, we'll start over here, right here on the front row to our left, Coach, the very front row. Uh, good morning, Coach Michael Gibbs with the War Report. Uh, in this new SEC, uh, Georgia got a pretty tough road draw. You've got Alabama on the road. You've got Texas on the road. You've got Ole Miss on the road. You also have Kentucky on the road. Can you talk about your road schedule and how you're preparing your team for this, this tough 2024 schedule? Yeah, initially I was wondering how I got that draw, you know, but uh, we're not one to complain. We're one to be excited. Um, I think when you step into the shoes of a University of Georgia football player, you accept that that challenge is going to be there. I mean, we, we, we kind of embrace that and we love it. I mean, in what you didn't get to mention is that we open with Clemson too, who's uh, one of the top teams in the program, top programs in the country. So, like, we're really excited about that. I think that motivates our offseason so that we have uh, the right kind of uh, approach to the offseason. Uh, and, and, you know, our, our, our guys embrace that. I mean, as coaches, you want to play the best. And people forget that when you spend time in the NFL, every week was like that. So when Texas and Oklahoma came into the conference, every schedule was going to get harder. We're going to get easier. It's going to get harder. And uh, we embrace that. We look forward to it and uh, excited for the challenge to go to some really tough places. The coach will go right down the center aisle, right here on the near aisle. Uh, Coach Smart, Drew D. Armand, WCC and Radio Huntsville, Alabama. Looks like your mentor, Nick Saban, when you compete. Now it's going to be some questions for Kirby Smart. As you mentioned, the four guys you brought in, what, were you, what was your thoughts on bringing in Trevarius Robinson, and what does he bring to your staff? Well, first of all, he has 
a great pedigree, a player. He played in the SEC, and one of the things you can never really um, justify or explain to people is the culture of the SEC. Number one, recruiting. It's tough. It's hard. It's uh, cutthroat, and you don't have experience in those battles. It's hard to win those battles. He was a really good player. Um, he played for Coach Tuberville, who has a lot of stories about T. Rob and the great job he's done. I've always recruited against him and had respect for him on the road, the way he carries himself, the way he presents himself, uh, the fact he worked for Coach Muschamp. They have a great relationship. Coach Muschamp vouched for him and talked about the great job he's did, done, and he brought in a tremendous energy uh, into our secondary, which is a young secondary, and he got the, the, the valuable time that he got to spend over with uh, Coach Saban in Alabama, which is invaluable in terms of knowing how our program operates. So I'm excited to have T. Rob, his family. He's got a wonderful uh, family, and I know he's excited to be with us. Coach, we'll go to the section just to your right. Uh, yeah, Coach Brooks, also my dog, Staley. You mentioned that moment uh, UAB with Carson Beck. And when he reflects on that moment, he thought of it as an opportunity to say, hey, I'm not quite ready for this. I need to continue to develop. Stuck around for a couple more years before he was a star. Is that a repeatable trait or a common trait? Maybe you can look for in future athletes that you recruit of, because it's important nowadays guys leave when they don't have an opportunity to play, but this is a very unique example. Is this something you might be able to replicate in the future? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to be able to replicate the DNA he has with which quarterback Carson back returns for a senior season. difference when they stay in your program so the retention is really critical because we think the process we go through of the off-field training the on-field training the weight room training the football training is going to pay off in the years they've been there Carson's a great example of that all those years of practice and third down and pressure periods and blitz pickups paid off when he got to start it's not to say he wasn't ready UAB he may have been ready we felt like Stetson gave us the best chance to win that game, and he played lights out that game and never really looked back after that. Um, who's to say that Carson might not have done the same thing, but he certainly responded the right way, and I wish we could kind of inject it shift and say that every kid had that response, but we know that's not going to be the case. Coach, we'll go back over here to our far left on the front row. Hey, Coach. Graham Coffee, Dog Central .com. Uh, When you look at your schedule and the potential of playing 16, 17 games, do you think that will change how you guys manage uh, maybe a lead or trying to get guys out of games earlier? And will it add any importance to the overall strength of your roster? Improve any, what was the ending part of that? The overall strength and depth on your roster just from one to 85. Playing the schedule we play uh, and improving the strength of the roster, I don't know. Um, if that's the case, I think the way we go about practicing is critical. I believe in having a physical tough camp. I don't think you back off from that. If you do, it may not matter about those games. If you're not physical enough in the line of scrimmage and you're not tough enough and you don't demand excellence, because during the season there's only so much we can do to create the toughness that we need at the line of scrimmage and the, the toughness we need as an overall football team. Camp stuff. You know, and, and I think that's important that it remains tough. We do have to be smart to stay healthy. We have certain areas of our team that we maybe have more depth than others, and you got to be smart and calculated about the risk you take of uh, losing guys. But um, hey, I think every coach is reflecting right now saying, okay, we may have a longer schedule. We certainly have a tougher schedule. How we play games is play to win. And how we play at the end of the games, if we have leads, we, we've always looking to get guys opportunity and grow players, a la Carson Beck, getting into a lot of games when he was behind Stetson so they're ready when their opportunity comes. Which will go down the mid aisle. I'm here on the section in front of me about three quarters of the way back. Hey, Coach. Raphael Cruz, dog time at Lake Oconee News. You lost three senior leaders in Javon Bullard, Tyke Smith, and Kamari Lasseter in the secondary. Who are some of the guys that are stepping in this offseason that you're excited about competing for those starting spots? Yeah, first off, I'll, I'll, I'll correct you there. The two of those guys were, were actually juniors. They weren't seniors, and that's that's what that's what really gets your program. When you lose two juniors in one room that are excellent players and have been unbelievable kids within our program, and, and they love football. Now, they, they, they came to every practice.
practice this spring, and they were getting ready to get drafted, and they were in every practice cheering on guys, coaching guys, the right kind of guys to have uh, around your program. So uh, they're, they're tough losses. Um, we've got some good, young, talented players in the secondary. It's going to be really important they grow up fast. They're going to go against a really high-tempo offense in Clemson to start with. Um, our job is to prepare them. They get to go against a really good offense day in and day out with Carson Beck. So I'm excited about the guys we have in that room, and they'll step up to play. We have some experience in the safety position between Dan and Malachi, but it'll be the nickel position and the depth at those positions that's really critical. Go to the section right to your right, again on the aisle. I'm Bart Richardson, Orange Bloods head coach. How do you navigate the world of NIL where you have to participate in it to be competitive, but you also have players who lead with that and they just want to get paid? What are your conversations like with recruits and current players, and how do you navigate it all? I think it's a mistake to assume that all players lead with that or that's the primary objective. I think that would be an insult to high school football players and really insult to all people being recruited because I, I don't experience, I don't get to the finish line of official visits where that's the primary objective. If it is, we're probably not getting to that point. We're probably not going to be in the conversation if that's the primary objective. Is that one of the key decision makers? Yes. And should it, should it be? Yes. I'm, I'm happy that these kids get an opportunity to improve their situation or uh, make money and give back to their families or in some cases their communities. So that doesn't bother me at all. I have no problem navigating that. I've gotten less uh, attached and said, you know what, if it's better for that young man because of a financial difference between us and another school, I respect that decision and opinion they have to make. I have to worry about the players that we do get Okay, and I worry about the ones that we do sign that they're the right kind of kids and they're coming for the right reason. That that includes money, but it's not just money. Okay, we'll go down the center aisle, the section in front of me. Oh, John I Fox oh, Seven Austin. Uh, coach, you mentioned wanting to play the best. You have Texas this year. Do you consider them to be one of the best? And what stands out to to you about them? Every team we play is the best that week. Please understand that. In the SEC, humility is a week away. I have a ton of respect for Sark and the job he does. We got to watch them play last year against uh, several common opponents. We got to watch them play in the playoffs. They have a tremendous recruiting base. Um, they do a tremendous job in recruiting. Is that, that includes NIL and everything included in that. So they're a big physical team. They're built like an SEC football team. So we're looking forward to an opportunity to come play them and uh, what a tremendous matchup it'll be. It will go over here again to our left, second row. Hey, Coach, Peter Roderick is from AO.com. What kind of impact did the Auburn game have on you guys' season last year, and what kind of challenges did that Auburn team or that new staff pose for y'all? Well, let's start with this. Auburn is one of the hardest places to play in the world, and I know that from 25 years of being a common opponent at Georgia and Alabama. When you step in that stadium, you better be laced up, strapped up, and ready to go regardless of their record, regardless of the expectation, regardless of what the people in Vegas say, you better be ready to play. And uh, I think Hugh does a tremendous job motivating his team. He does a tremendous job in the recruiting asset. And as he gets more and more of his players and his style of play in there, which he got some guys this year, they're going to be a force to be reckoned with. But that game helped give us confidence that we could play from behind. It also let us know that we're vulnerable in some areas and we had to improve on those. So I, I enjoyed playing in that venue I always have. It's one of the toughest places to go play. Which will go straight in front of me the section, Kirk. Uh, excuse me, Kirk Balls from the Houston Chronicle. Uh, with the 12 team playoff coming in, do you, do you worry about attrition? You know, because two teams will play at least 17 games, and you think maybe abolishing the conference championship game for all leagues would, would help the matter? You know, I'm not for doing that. I still find value in winning an SEC championship. The unique thing about the career that I've had in coaching, I've almost won as many SEC championships as national championships. And I've won two national championships when I didn't win SEC championships as a program. I mean, that, that that's that's unique. I mean, it, it doesn't, it's not supposed to happen that way. So do I worry about attrition in terms of having more games? I worry about attrition having four teams. 
Okay, every coach worries about attrition, right? You have to do a good job of maintaining your roster, staying healthy, um, practicing the right way, being smart, uh, and, and, and I think being a watchdog is part of my job. As I'm not a coordinator anymore, I want to watch the drills we do. I want to see how we practice. I want to make sure we can maintain health. It's hard to do in the SEC, but that's why you get an opportunity to recruit to 85 scholarships so that you have depth. Can you get your younger players ready faster than your opponent is a huge advantage. But no, I don't want to see the conference championship go away because I think it's one of the greatest venues in all of college sports, in all of sports. I mean, the, the games that we've played in Atlanta have been some of the best, most memorable games that I've ever been a part of. And to take that away, I, I, I think that, that there's going to be teams that look back on that SEC championship, and it's very meaningful. And I don't want to take away from that meaning. All right, we'll go here on our left. Voting me out. Lawrence Holmes, 670 to score Chicago. Kirby, your defenses throughout your whole career have been incredibly innovative. I was wondering, with offenses evolving, do you react to them or do you want them to react to you? And where do you go for the inspiration? Do you go forward or do you go all the way back to the beginning of the game? <laughs> That's a long question that I spent a lot of time on, you know, and I learned a lot from the defensive guy in the back of the room back there that uh, you're always adapting. You have to adjust to them, but you have to dictate to them as well. If you sit back nowadays and let offenses dictate to you, they can do enough things to, to drive down the field and be explosive and make big plays and score quickly that it can become frustrating. You have to have ways to create negative plays. I think every defensive coach would say that. But I do think looking forward and backwards is really important. You know, we have a, a relatively young defensive coordinator, Glenn Schumann, who spends more time on Zooms. He loves talking football. He spends time with NFL coaches, high school coaches. Some of the best ideas we've ever gotten and defensively came from great high school minds in the state that we were coaching in because they came up with really innovative ideas because they defend these offenses sometimes before we do. And uh, I've always been enamored with that in-game adjustment of what we can give a kid or give a defense to help them against something they're doing. You're always reacting, but you do want to dictate at times too by the way you pressure and the things you do. We'll take one final question of this center aisle. About three quarters of the way back. Coach Joe Gates at BamaCentral.com. You played a lot of great games against the University of Alabama in your time. How do you expect the, those matchups to change with, the, with co Coach Kevin Boer in charge? Um, I don't expect them to change. That's two great universities. I mean, you're talking about uh, two teams that have been at the forefront of uh, college football, and it's probably going to be that way uh, for a long time. Both great universities, both committed. The commitment to excellence at both places is really high. The standard that, that, that Coach created there at Alabama and the standard we've created, those two are going to be matching up for a long time, and I think it's what's great about college athletics. Coach, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Kevin. And I was great listening from Kirby Smart as I head football Smart, coach course, the from the University of Georgia, Georgia. Bulldogs the football team. They, the challenge of their difficult schedule. A lot more from us they got a difficult schedule because they got Dallas. Alabama and Texas.